Chapter 2 His head hurt. Michael ignored the pain and pressed forward. He hadn't bothered to sleep. The legal team had swilled enough coffee to float an ocean liner, and the claimant deal was complete as it was going to get. So were several other important matters. He'd made the call to his lawyer after taking Anne's phone and address book. The new will was ready to be signed and witnessed today. The three temps had performed beautifully, making copies, getting coffee and snacks, generally just being impressively useful. However, it had taken three to do what Anne could do simply by herself. His Anne who had quit. Michael shoved the thought away, along with the confusing conversation about babies. There wasn't enough time. He'd scheduled an emergency board meeting for Thursday morning at six. Most in the board were unimpressed with the early hour, and some wondered if there was an issue with the Claymont acquisition. Michael didn't bother to explain. However, there was one important person that he needed there. When Michael had stepped into his father David's role as head of the company— David had handed over his controlling shares. As a result, Michael now had 31% of the vote. Noah had 10%. Max had 10%, but didn't know it. When Max had left the company, he had sold his shares. He had needed the money to supplement a fund that would pay for the medical fees of each child who had suffered because of a drug that the company had put into market. The drug was designed to help children with diabetes metabolize correctly. Instead, it had been pushed through too fast, and incorrect lab results had been created. The drug shut down kidneys and livers, causing death to hundreds of children. In court, the company had proven that the drug wasn't responsible for the issues these children were having. Michael knew that his father, David, had had a hand in the cover-up, and had vowed that under his tenure, as head of the company, it would never happen again. Max had felt responsible, and in the end had given literally everything he had, and everything he earned over the next six years to the fund to aid these families. To help Max start the fund, Michael had a fictitious company made up in Max's name to purchase the shares for him at a slightly above market value. The shares remained in Max's possession, only he didn't know about it. Now Michael needed his vote. So, right after the trip to the lawyer, Michael was in the car with the driver driving him to Paget Williams' apartment. He'd kept tabs on Max, just like his father had kept tabs on all of his sons, keeping a private investigator busy investigating their lives rather than just keeping in touch. There was a reason Michael had no personal life. He hadn't wanted his father to use it against him at any point in his career. Not that David hadn't tried. Now it was a habit, being isolated from everything and everyone but work. Michael regretted not being more involved in Max's life, but Noah had been there for their brother. Plus, it would have damaged his relationship with their father further after he had argued in favor of Max's solution. Michael had stood between David suing Max, his own son, over the entire matter. No one knew except Michael and David. Michael had also managed to quietly pull the drug off the market, citing legal concerns. It had been difficult and time-consuming, but it was the right thing to do. He admired Max's conviction and resolve. He admired the way Max could stand up for what was right, ignoring the consequences. Michael simply wasn't that man. He weighed the consequences continually. A car drew to a halt near a tired park. Everything was tired here. The buildings, the people... It was a shabby but neat neglect. Slowly the neighborhood was descending from its previous splendor perhaps forty or fifty years prior. Max lived here with his fiancée, Paget, a previous society girl who was widowed and down on her luck. Together they made a wonderful couple. They seemed to make each other happy if the P.I.'s reports and photos were correct. He knew that Noah and L. had befriended the couple. Michael walked through the park, ignoring an old man who slept on the bench. At the apartment building entrance, he went to buzz the correct apartment when an old lady, pushing a walker, went through the door. Michael took the opportunity to simply enter. Max would be less likely to turn him down in person. It took only a few moments and two flights of stairs to reach Paget's apartment. Michael hesitated, drawing a deep, calming breath, and then knocked firmly. There was laughter from inside, and he could hear Max say, "'I'll get it in just a minute.' The door swung open, and the two brothers stood face to face. Michael! It had been six years since they had spoken. Six years, two months, five days. Michael knew exactly when. 
It was little facts like this that made his mind a legal trap. Hello, Max. Paget pushed around Max to see who was at the door. It was obvious she was curious to see him, the brother who hadn't been in Max's life for so long. Hello, I'm Paget. Good manners had him shaking her proffered hand. Pleased to meet you. Won't you come in? she asked in return. Michael thanked her politely. The apartment was old and tired, but homey. He liked it despite its neglect and age. Mostly he liked it because it was much better than his brother sleeping in the parks on the street. You have a lovely home. Thank you, Paget gave him a tentative smile. She really was a pretty thing with her red hair and fair skin. Michael, why are you here? Max cut right to the heart of the matter, ignoring Paget's silent look telling him not to be rude. Michael liked her the more for it. Because I need you to do something for me. Max folded his arms. Michael knew that stubborn look. This likely wasn't going to go well. Why? Would you like to have a seat or something to drink? Paget offered, trying to diffuse the tension as a good hostess would. Michael offered her a small smile. Thank you for the offer, but it's unlikely that I'll be staying very long. What do you need, Michael? Max asked. He sighed. He hadn't expected this to be easy. As you know, I am now head of the company and director of the board since Dad's retirement. It means I have a controlling interest of 31%. Yes, and Noah has 10. What of it? There's going to be an important vote tomorrow morning. I need your vote, Max. Max shrugged. I don't have any shares. I can't help you. Michael took some paperwork out of his inside suit jacket pocket and offered it to Max. You have retained all of your shares. Max took the papers and scanned through them. This is a dummy company in my name. I created the company and put it in your name. Since you were determined to sell, it bought you out, and you've maintained ownership of the shares. I put in some extra funds to pay any income taxes on it, and had an accountant refile your taxes for you each year. Michael quietly explained, I didn't want you to get in trouble with the IRS. Why? Max asked, puzzled. Michael shrugged. You're my brother. You did this, using your money. Max sought clarification. Yes. Dad didn't know. If he had ever found out that I had put my money into your fund to help those affected by our company's mistake with that diabetic drug, I would have been fired, Michael said dryly. It was the truth. David could be ruthless. He was pretty sure David had never known. What is the vote for? Max folded up the papers and gently set them on the kitchen table. He grabbed a cup of coffee and handed it to Michael. It was a reconciliatory gesture. Michael took the coffee gratefully. He needed the caffeine. I'd rather not say. Come on, Michael. You can't just come in here asking for my vote, not tell me what it's for. Max was angry and disappointed. It's obvious you think that the other members of the board aren't going to like it, because you wouldn't be lobbying for votes otherwise. I need to know, because I'm not going in blind. Please, Max, Michael said. I need you there. I need you to vote with me. You'll hear the motion when everyone else does. I need you to second the nomination I put forward and vote with me. It's imperative that you do. The emergency meeting of the board is for six in the morning tomorrow. So early? What is so important? Max persisted. Michael set down the coffee. I know I haven't been a good brother to you for the past six years. I'm sorry for that. I should have done more to help you. I should have done a lot of things. He thought of Anne with regret. I will never be able to apologize enough. If you can make it to tomorrow's meeting, I will be eternally grateful. Max reluctantly took Michael's proffered hand. He knew that he wasn't going to get any more details. Michael turned to Paget and congratulated her on the ring. Max is a very lucky man. He took his leave of both of them and hoped he had said enough to convince Max. Max would come. Max would vote correctly. Michael tried to have faith, yet it was difficult under the circumstances. An ominous black floating cloud kept pace at the side of his vision and his head felt like the woodpeckers had been upgraded to jackhammers. He hadn't bothered to take any of the prescribed pain pills. One of the major side effects was drowsiness and possible confusion. He needed to be alert. Would Noah vote as Michael wanted him to? He didn't know. He wasn't going to ask. 
it would be better to simply surprise him along with the rest of the board. If Noah had time to think about the implications of what was about to take place, he'd fight it tooth and nail. Thirty minutes later, the car was outside a high-rise apartment building in a much classier side of town. Michael rubbed his tired eyes. He desperately wanted to sleep, but there was no time. He'd sleep during the surgery, which was looming ever closer. Walking to the front lobby, Michael selected the appropriate button and waited. Hello? Anne's melodious voice voted back to him. Anne, I'd like to talk to you if I could. It felt like a full minute passed before she buzzed him in. A short elevator ride, and he stood awkwardly outside her door before knocking. He could hear her release the security chain before opening the door. She stood before him in yoga gear, her hair down and her feet bare. He realized he had never seen her hair down. It reached just past her shoulder blades. It was gorgeous like her. "'I'm not coming back,' she stated quietly. "'I'm not asking you to.' He realized that was true. He hadn't come to ask her back, no matter how desperately he wanted her to. "'I want you to be happy, and if you're not happy at Ramsey Pharma, then you need to do what's best for you.' She digested this for a moment. "'Then why did you come?' "'You've been the best secretary that I've ever had. You've also been a good friend.' "'Thank you.' She waited patiently while he sorted his thoughts. "'I'd like to present you with a token of appreciation for your dedication and service to the company. I've put a package together to help you while you transition your life,' he explained. He could see that she was getting annoyed and hurried to add, "'I hope that you'll accept it.' "'Thank you, Michael, but it's not necessary.' "'It is necessary,' he insisted. "'Anne, I can never thank you enough for all that you've done for me. Please, accept this gift.' She looked so disappointed." rather like the time he had come to pick her up for their first social occasion outside of work. He explained it as a learning experience to get her to know the clients better, but he'd really wanted to show up the country club with her on his arm. She'd worn some frothy peach dress that had hugged her curves and showed it off with an expectant ta-da, and he'd stood there dumbstruck, unable to give voice or words to the vision that was before him. The moment had passed, and no matter how he had tried to compliment her after, it had fallen flat. She had been very disappointed then, and he'd never been able to make it up to her. He had the feeling that he disappointed her a lot, and he wasn't sure why. Anne sighed. Fine. Okay. Good. I'll see you tomorrow morning at six o'clock in boardroom C. He quickly retreated. What? Wait? I thought you were going to give me this gift now, she called as he left. Boardroom C, six a.m., he called back over his shoulder as he walked briskly down the hall. She would come. Anne was too curious to do otherwise. Michael nearly smiled in satisfaction as he rode the elevator back to the ground floor. Now, to clean up a few other pieces before the big reveal in the morning, he ignored the black specter that rode the elevator with him. At precisely six in the morning, Anne made her way to boardroom C. She didn't want to delay this any longer than necessary. She'd settled on a braid, blouse, jeans, and ballet flats. She no longer worked at Ramsey Pharma, therefore she didn't feel the need to dress formally. Inside the boardroom, the board of controlling share members were gathered, and Anne halted. Michael must have made a mistake. She'd never been invited to a board meeting. Secretaries didn't attend such meetings. She didn't see Michael in the boardroom, so she turned around to go to Michael's office and bumped into someone. Taking a step back, she was surprised to see Maxwell Ramsley. Anne. Wow, it's good to see you. It's been a long time. Max smiled boyishly down at her. You look good. Casual, but good. Thanks. You look good, too. How have you been? She was surprised that Max was in the building. As far as she knew, he and Michael were still estranged. Curiosity bubbled up. What was Max doing here? Great. I've met an amazing, beautiful woman who has agreed to help me retire my bachelor life. "'Can I send you an invite to the wedding?' he asked. Anne blinked. The playboy had fallen hard. She was interested to see the woman who had managed it. "'Sure, I liked that.' Noah came walking down the corridor, sipping a coffee. When he spotted Anne and Max, he paused in surprise before coming over to them. "'Max, is there something going on that I should know about?' "'I'm here at Michael's request,' Max explained. "'I take it you're in the dark about this board meeting, too?' Why would Michael need you at a board meeting? Noah got right to the point. You'll find out soon enough. 
Michael came up behind Anne and laid his hands on her shoulders. He steered her in front of him into the boardroom. Michael, I don't think I'm supposed to be here, Anne whispered. It's fine. There's a seat right here for you. Michael pulled out a chair and gently pushed her into it. Max and Noah sat down as well, and there were some murmurs of surprise and recognition from other board members as they saw Max. Michael cleared his throat, standing at the head of the table. "'Thank everyone for coming out to this emergency meeting so early in the morning. I have two items to table today, so this meeting should be very brief. Before I do, I'd like to welcome Max back to the director's meetings. As you all know, Max is still shareholder of this company.' There was a pause to acknowledge this before Michael continued. First, I'd like to thank Anne Shaver for her years of service and dedication to this company. She's been and continues to be an outstanding member of the team. In recognition of her achievements, I'd like to transfer all my controlling shares to Miss Schaefer. There was a shocked silence. Michael owned the most controlling shares. The net financial worth of the shares was huge. The direct sway for vote in the company was the envy of many of the board members. To give all of his shares to a secretary? Unheard of. You can't be serious, Ozit said, sputtering. Michael, maybe you should think this through, Gaines tried to reason. Anne sat there dumbfounded. I need someone to second my motion. Michael looked directly at Max. Please. Max didn't have to ask Michael if this was what he wanted. He knew. Even though they had been estranged from each other for six long years, Max knew that Michael would never ask for something like this, something this major for the company and for himself, unless he had thought it out completely. He didn't understand why Michael would do this, but he would support him. I second the motion. What? Noah exploded. Michael, really? Michael cleared his throat and held up a hand. Put to a vote to transfer the shares. I'll say A. A. Hey, replied Max, putting up his hand. This is a farce, Ozit said. I don't care how good she is in bed. You can't just transfer your shares to her. All three Ramsleys glared at Ozit. Anne blushed, feeling mortified. Noah, Michael asked softly. If this is what you really want, he shook his head, obviously disagreeing. But family loyalty had him raise his hand. Hey. Michael took in a steadying breath. Motion stands and passes for the vote. Let the record state this. Next, I'd like to talk about a resignation. I don't accept the shares, Anne stood suddenly. Michael, you can't do this. It's already legally done. Michael took out a pen and signed his name on a document that was in front of him. He handed it to Deagle to be witnessed. The shares are in your name. To be a controlling board member, you have to be a member of the company in good standing. I resigned three days ago, Anne reminded him. I refused your resignation, he said simply. Excuse me? Anne couldn't believe what she was hearing. As your boss, I have the right to refuse your resignation. I refused it, Michael explained. Miss Schaefer, you are still an employee of this company in good standing. I, however, am not. Effective immediately, I am tendering my resignation. I'd like to recommend Gaines as my replacement as head of the company and director of the board. I'd like to recommend Deagle as my replacement for head of the legal department. An alarm beeped on Michael's cell phone. He shut it off, and Deagle began handing out copies of Michael's resignation letter. There was a buzz of noise as the men exclaimed over the resignation. Noah turned to Max, asking if he had any idea that this was about to happen. Anne watched as Michael quietly left the room. No one seemed to notice. She grabbed her purse and walked quickly after him. He turned off the normal route, bypassing his office where all his personal effects had already been removed and shipped to the beach house. He went down a secondary staircase, grabbing an overnight bag that had been left in the stairwell. "'Michael?' she asked. He paused and let her catch up. "'What is going on? Why are you doing this? This company has been your whole life. You can't just resign.' "'You did,' he said simply. Anne stared at him, speechless. "'Please keep walking. I have some place I need to be.' Michael turned and kept going down the stairs. "'Where do you have to be? What could be more important than what just happened back there in the boardroom?' Anne hurried to catch up to him. "'If we go back, maybe you can tell them this was a joke or something. We could undo the damage and you can get your position back.' "'That's not going to happen.' Michael pushed open a side door. Outside, the car was waiting. The driver took his overnight bag and placed it in the trunk. 
Michael turned to face Anne. He didn't want to apologize for what had happened, and he didn't want to talk about it any more. Mostly, he just wanted to hug her and never let her go, but of course he couldn't do that. Almost without his violation, his hands came up to cup her face. He swallowed thickly. Goodbye, Anne. She stared up at him, confused and a little afraid. Michael dropped his hands and got into the waiting car. The driver shut the door and got into the front seat. Suddenly, the door was opened by Anne. Move over. Anne, I really need to be leaving, he tried to explain. You're not going to move over, are you? she said crisply. Anne! He jerked slightly as she crawled over him and sat beside him. I don't know where you're going, but I'm coming with. Anne, he closed his eyes, please leave. No. Mr. Ramsley, we need to be going if we're going to get there on time, the driver gently reminded him. Michael sighed. Anne? No. She reached across him and shut the door before telling the driver, Please continue to wherever you are scheduled to take Mr. Ramsley. Anne, please don't do this. Michael feared his voice was slightly tinged with desperation. The car had started moving, driving toward the hospital. Tell me what is going on. Tell me where you're going and why, Anne insisted stubbornly. How could he? How could he tell her that today he was probably going to die? And if by some quirk of fate he didn't die, that he was going to be damaged, changed in a horrible and irreversible way. That was, if things went to plan, best-case scenario. If it didn't, he could be a vegetable wishing he was dead for the rest of his life. He'd taken the time to read the list of everything that could possibly go wrong, and none of it was pleasant. How did anyone say such news? He swallowed hard and looked out the window at the passing city, going about its daily business without care. Then her fingers threaded through his, holding his hand. He didn't dare look at her for fear of what he might do, but his hand tightened in hers and he was thankful for the small comfort that she offered. The ride to the hospital was all too short. The driver held the door and Michael helped Anne out of the car. Once he had his overnight bag, Michael led Anne through the maze of corridors to the surgical admitting area. She continued to hold his hand and was mercifully silent. Name? The clerk behind the glass looked up at him. Michael David Ramsley. She looked at her list. The doctor's office sent over your paperwork already. Can you please tell me why you're here? For surgery, he said dryly. What kind of surgery are you having today? She sighed. It's standard that we ask. Dr. Hemond is removing two masses from my brain, Michael replied. He could feel Anne stiffen beside him. And who is this? The clerk looked at Anne. This is Anne. "'Will she be with you in the ward before and after surgery?' "'Yes,' Anne said firmly. Her other hand crept around and held on to his arm tightly. "'Yes, I will.' "'Thank you. Please wait in the waiting room across the hall. A nurse will be with you shortly.' They turned and went to the waiting room. It was full of uncomfortable chairs. Michael picked one at random and sat down, Anne sitting beside him. She kept her hands clasped and her other hand on his arm, leaning against him. He welcomed her warmth. The television was on some show meant for toddlers, and the magazines in the corner were predominantly about home decor. Michael didn't care. Anne was there, and that was all that mattered. "'Why didn't you say anything?' she whispered. "'Remember the day you resigned? I had an appointment with Dr. Reynolds.' Michael stared down at their joined hands. She nodded. "'That was when I found out.' "'And they need to do the surgery so quickly?' she asked, alarmed. "'Yes.' He turned to her and covered her other hand with his free one. And I want to apologize for anything I might have done to disappoint you. I want you to understand that all I want for you is to be happy. You're a smart, beautiful woman, and you deserve everything your heart desires. Michael? Suddenly she was very afraid. How risky is this surgery? Michael Ramsley? A nurse asked in the doorway. He stood and picked up the overnight bag. Anne quickly stood beside him. Mr. Ramsley, if you'll just follow me. He did, with Anne beside him. The nurse brought him to a room full of gurney-type beds. She pulled on a sheet that hung from the ceiling to create a feeling of privacy. She showed him the washroom, the cupboard to put his things, the hospital gown on the bed. He was to get changed and then sit on the bed. A nurse would be along shortly to put an IV into his arm in preparation for the surgery. He was to be the first patient of the day. The nurse closed the curtain as she left. There was a chair by the bed for Anne to sit in. 
Michael picked up the hospital gown. I suppose I had better get changed. Anne nodded and let go of his arm. It took only a few minutes in the washroom to strip and then put on the gown. He felt ridiculous wearing only it. He put his clothes, watch, and wallet carefully in the overnight bag and then put it in his shoes in the closet where the nurse had shown him. He sat on the bed, waiting. Anne was perched in the chair, nervously playing with her purse strap. A cheery nurse, little more than a teenager, came and inserted the IV. She was very good. He hardly felt it. Or, perhaps because he was used to so much pain already, a simple needle didn't register with him any more. She returned with an electric shaver. She explained that it would be easiest if Michael's entire head was shaved. Would he prefer to do it? If not, she could. I will, Anne volunteered. Michael wondered if it made her feel better to have something to do. They ended up in the washroom, he in the chair with her with the shaver, and a couple of towels around his shoulders. She hesitated. I can do this if you don't want to, he looked up at her. I just feel like if I don't shave your head, then none of this needs to happen. She gently pushed her fingers through his hair. It needs to happen. There are two tumors in my head that need to come out. That's why you've been having so many headaches lately. You've always had the migraines, but they're worse now. Yes. He didn't bother to tell her about the hallucinations. There was little point. Hopefully they would be gone when he woke up. If he woke up. Anne nodded and clicked on the shaver. Soon all of his hair was on the floor. Catching his reflection in the mirror, he thought he didn't look like himself. Perhaps he should have specified closed casket for the funeral. He'd prepaid for one, and all the details had been seen to. Anne removed the towels that had been thoughtfully provided to protect the hospital gown from the hair. The young nurse knocked on the door frame. They're ready for you now, Mr. Ansley. He didn't feel ready for them. He turned to Anne. He had no idea what to say, but suddenly she was in his arms, hugging him. For a moment he hugged her back, trying to memorize the feel of her, her smell, this moment. It's going to be all right, he lied. He had no idea. Anne nodded and let him go. All too soon he was in the bed, blanket over his legs. The little efficient nurse pulled up the bed rails and released the brakes. She promised Anne that she would take good care of him as she pulled and pushed his bed down the corridor. He felt silly in bed while his petite young nurse wheeled him around. Keeping up a cheery, steady chatter about the weather, the awful food in the cafeteria, how she woke up and found out her son had glued Cheerios to her forehead this morning before her shift for the hospital, she pointed to her forehead. Tell me truthfully, do I still have glue? Despite himself, Michael smiled. No. That's a relief. She grinned and tapped a button on the wall with her foot, and a door began to automatically open. Well, Mr. Ramsley? I'm sorry, but I have to hand you over to the OR nurses. I'll see you when you get back out of surgery. Will you check on Anne while I'm in surgery? He asked suddenly. Sure. You and your wife are so sweet. The two other nurses came to wheel him into the room, and he didn't bother to correct the young nurse as she bounced away, humming a tune. Good morning, Mr. Ramsley. The nurses had him transfer himself to the other bed. They were older, more serious about their job. He was made comfortable as he could be under the circumstances. Then the anesthesiologist came and explained how they are going to put him to sleep during the operation. He put the mask over Michael's face and asked questions. What do you like to do? Sailing, jogging, reading, Michael answered by rote. Suddenly he added, I write. He never told anyone that he wrote. What do you write? Poetry, children's stories. My brothers are ten and twelve years younger than me. I used to write them stories. I've journaled for years. He couldn't remember what else he said, but it seemed like moments later before someone was calling his name. Michael felt confused as he focused on the nurse. Michael, on a scale of one to ten, how bad is your pain? she asked. Pain, he repeated. He meant to say eight, perhaps even a nine. Pain. One to ten. Pick a number, ten being the worst. She was annoying. Perhaps he should say nine. His head did hurt rather badly. Pain. Pain. Suddenly the noise in the operating room stilled. Dr. Hemmond came over and asked in heavily accented English, Michael, tell me your name and address. Pain. Fruit pain. Michael listened to the words tumble out of his mouth, and the truth dawned on him. It had happened. He couldn't speak the right words at the right time. He wouldn't be able to read. He wouldn't be able to write. Shock followed by desolation filled him as he closed his eyes. 
What had Dr. Reynolds called it? Speech aphasia. Let's get him a sedative, Dr. Hemmons said, and shortly the world fell away again. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Words Unspoken. Also, please subscribe to the channel to enjoy other audiobooks, helpful videos, and insights into writing. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.